Good morning. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute, and welcome to our conference, The Promise and the Risk of the AI Revolution. And I ask our audience to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Each year, the Naval Institute partners with the Naval Academy to put on an applied history conference on an important topic. And we are deeply grateful to the William M. Wood Foundation for their support sponsoring this now in its 10th year. Representing the Wood Foundation is Mr. Ed Condit, accompanied by his wife, Nancy, and we thank them. We're privileged to have with us a distinguished group of speakers, panelists, and moderators to delve into what is artificial intelligence and what is not artificial intelligence, to deal with the rise of AI over the decades, and also to examine what it means for our future. The Wall Street Journal recently noted, quote, AI will have a profound effect on our jobs, our health, and possibly our very existence. But that's where the consensus ends, unquote. We've had the pleasure of working with the Department of Computer Science here at the Naval Academy, um, led by Professor Chris Brown, who's also had strong support from several of his colleagues, Dr. Gavin Taylor, Dr. Rick Crabb, Dr. Nate Chambers, and Dr. Luke McDowell. They all worked tirelessly to make this event a success. Additionally, we've had terrific support from midshipmen volunteers, and I'd like to especially do a shout out for midshipman Chesley Krug. We extend a special welcome today to our midshipmen guests who will filter in here from class. They have displays in the lobby where several of them are working on projects associated with artificial intelligence. And in the period, in the break, after the afternoon keynote and before the afternoon panel, there'll be some time for our audience to go out into the lobby, check out what the mids have been working on, and I encourage you all to engage them. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Commandant of Midshipmen, AKA the Daunt. A USNA 92 grad, a career submariner, Captain T.R. Buchanan has served in both attack submarines and ballistic missile submarines. He served on USS Asheville, SSN 758, USS Florida SSBN 728 Gold, USS Norfolk SSN 714, and he also commanded USS Albany SSN 753. In major command, he commanded Submarine Squadron 20 and was responsible for the operational certification and training for all the Atlantic Fleet's strategic ballistic missile submarines. Ashore, he's had several important assignments, including aid to director of naval reactors, officer in charge of Task Force 54 detachment in Bahrain, and the lead shipbuilding analyst in the OPNAV staff in the programming division. Most recently, he completed a tour as the executive assistant as the director of the joint staff. Captain Buchanan holds a master's degree from George Washington University, and I had the privilege of working with him closely at the Naval Institute, at the Board of Control, and the editorial board in the late 90s. Please give the 88th Commandant of Midshipmen a warm welcome. Admiral Daly, thank you for that uh, introduction. I appreciate it very much, and it's great to be back uh, involved with the Naval Institute um, from, from a long time ago. So first off, welcome, welcome to Annapolis. On behalf of Vice Admiral Sean Buck, the 
63rd Superintendent of the United States Naval Academy. I'd like to welcome you here on a drizzly, uh, wet October day um, after celebrating a victory over our football, r football foes, uh, USF, and hope, and hope of a victory this weekend against Tulane. If this is your first time to Annapolis, uh, terrific. And if it's your 100th time, welcome back. As the command chaplain, Father Frank Foley likes to say, and I agree with this message each and every time he says it at Mass, uh, you are welcome here anytime and all the time. I'm excited to play just a small role in this Naval Institute Conference, which has been in existence in its current form since 2011. It's been key in advancing and exploration of challenging and relevant topics. And I'm confident that the examination of these questions and engagement with many community experts will be both impactful and beneficial. And this topic, AI revolution, is uh, quite timely and relevant. When I normally have the podium, I usually talk about what makes the Naval Academy so special. And simply, it is the midshipmen. Developing the men and women of the classes of 2020, 2021, 22, and 23 is a great opportunity. And, and developing them into Naval officers of character is our charter, and it is our mission. And I, have to, I often speak of three key principles, developing the character of a professional naval officer, building competence of a professional naval officer, and living the core values of a professional naval officer. And I enjoy talking about leadership, but to be part of this conference highlighting the risk and promise of artificial intelligence is certainly not a bad way to spend the day. It's now uniquely possible to build societal scale inference and decision-making systems involving machines, humans, and the environment. The potential benefits of doing so for naval missions and for myriad of other problem domains are, are across society are extraordinary. Yet with all of this promise, we're also discovering that such systems expose us to serious conceptual flaws, the risks of misuse, risks of accident, and broader structural risks around unconstrained racing among nations are all coming into sharp focus. Across the military and the private sector, academia, and civil society, everyone is beginning to grapple with this shift and the promise and peril it brings in their own way. To set the stage for today, I'll start with a quick historical perspective. The past in AI can be fairly described as the era of government-backed discovery, taking R&D expenditure as a proxy for innovation. Most technology of consequence during the half century from 1940 to 1990 came from the US and from the Department of Defense. Today, neither of these things is true. DOD is focused in the era of AI was enabling risky, discover, risky discovery funding from DARPA for basic research, such as perception, natural language understanding, and navigation, ultimately led to the creation of self-driving cars, personal assistance, and near natural prosthetics, and a myriad of other applications. And to say that that partnership among DOD industry and academia succeeded in transforming technolo technological practice would be dr dramatically understate the case. It transformed the world. At the end of the Cold War, however, the focus of innovation shifted to the commercial technology sector. And today, industry sets the pace. DOD has begun in earnest to think about how to translate AI into decisions and impact responsibly in the national security context. Its auspicious start has included the development of the DOD's first AI strategy drafting of AI principles for defense, the formation of a new organization, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. But how do we do more to translate the technology into decisions and impact? And since the technology, technology isn't done yet, how do we balance the need to still for, push for, forward in basic research and extend the frontier? 
can we realize the promise? Or will our AI's impact on US national security or on society reveal its peril? Time will certainly tell. And our first guest is Dr. Sridhar Mahidvan. Earlier this year, he assembled leading researches, researchers, the likes of Yoshua Bengio and Judea Pearl at an event at Stanford University called Beyond Curve Fitting, Causation, Counterfactuals, and Imagine Nation-Based AI. In the engagement, he asked, despite the progress, there is a growing segment of the scientific community that questions whether these successes can be extrapolated to create general AI without a major retooling. The idea, or this idea of starting over at precisely the time when the technology seems most potent reminds me of a quote from the physicist Richard Feynman, who said, it does not do any good to just increase the number of researchers following the comet head. It's necessary to increase the amount of variety. And the only way to do, do it is to implore you, few, to take a risk with your lives that you will never be heard of again and go off on into the wild blue yonder and see if you can figure it out. With that inspirational quote and forgiving me for the Air Force wild blue yonder reference, and I cer certainly can do that since we crushed our Air Force in football, please give me a round of applause for Dr. Mahedvin. Thank you all for coming. I'm honored to be here. I want to make sure that you can actually hear me if I walk away. No. Yes? No? no? A little louder. A little louder. OK. Now I think all right. It's on your TV. OK. Um, so I'm honored to be here. Um, I've been involved in AI for almost four decades. Uh, it's been an incredible adventure. Um, I came to the United States in the early 1980s uh, when AI was a very young field. I was privileged to work with one of the leaders in the field, uh, Tom Mitchell, who is currently Dean of the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon, uh, one of the world's largest academic programs for computer science. And through working with him, I came to know many of the founders of AI and um, I was privileged to work with a lot of people. And I'm going to try to give you a sense for um, you know, where AI began and where it's going so that we uh, can understand the future better by understanding the past. So since I'm speaking at a Naval Institute, I'm going to try to make some analogies uh, to Naval history that uh, I hope you'll uh, appreciate. So I want to begin my story in 1950, and I chose that date because uh, it was the date, uh, it was a year when a very influential publication uh, was uh, published in Britain uh, by someone who had uh, contributed an enormous amount uh, to winning the Second World War, and we'll see his story in a minute. Uh, and so we want to ask the question, uh, how much have we progressed in these 70 years since 1950? And um, where can we expect AI to go from here? So those are the things that I'm going to take up. So one way to understand the progress of AI is to look at uh, something that we have been successful at, which is to build flying machines. Um, ever since uh, man, uh, you know, started thinking about uh, his role um, and imagined uh, the kinds of things he could do, we always looked at the birds and wondered if we could fly like the birds. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, the early part of the 20th century that we actually achieved success when the Wright brothers uh, developed the first flying machines. And, um, just about six decades later, uh, Boeing introduced the 747. 
the Jumbo, uh, which is an amazing uh, amount of progress in six decades um, that we were able to build flying machines that fly near the speed of sound um, and take hundreds of passengers across thousands of miles. And five decades since, uh, the very same aircraft uh, is used to uh, carry uh, your commander in chief, our president, and uh, it's a testimony to the longevity of this design. So AI is in some ways in a similar place. Um, in 70 years, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still lots of challenges left. So to give you this analogy again, I'm sure you've all seen movies where we had flying cars, but we don't have flying cars. And if we had flying cars, um, I would love to buy one because of the traffic uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area where I live. And I'm sure the DC traffic is no better. Um, so we don't have flying cars, but actually one of my um, colleagues from grad school, Sebastian Thrun, um, has a startup in the Bay Area where they're building flying cars. And appropriately enough, it is called Kitty Hawk. Um, so we'll see where that goes. So um, to begin our story, we're going to look at how man uh, arose. Uh, in a unique manner, uh, our brains have endowed us with the capacity to imagine. This is a very powerful gift that we have. We can see the world not as it is, but as it might be. We can think about the future or the past. We can think of impossible things. So this figurine was discovered in a cave in Germany, um, and it's believed to have been carved 40,000 years ago. Um, and it's a remarkable testament to our ability to think abstractly. This shows the figure of a lion man, a person with the head of a lion. Uh, such a creature does not exist, yet one of our ancestors took the time to carve this figurine out. It gave no advantage in hunting. It was purely for art. And it shows that we have this capacity to think in a way that really goes beyond what any of the other species were able to do. And this is in large part the reason for our success. It's also uh, a reason for caution, as we'll see. My um, adventure uh, and journey into AI began uh, when I was a young student in India trying to decide what I wanted to do with my life. And I was actually training to be an electrical engineer. Um, this was before the internet. So the only way you could actually learn anything was to read books. And the only way you could get books was either go to the library or they had this thing called book fairs. We don't have book fairs anymore. but. You go to a book fair and you get books. And I discovered this marvelous book by Doug Hofstadter, published in 1979, um, on um, three individuals, uh, a mathematician, an artist, and a musician. But really, the whole book was about AI, because the subtext, which you might not be able to read, is uh, it's a metaphorical fugue on minds and machines in the spirit of Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll was the author of Alice in Wonderland. So one of the problems in the book uh, is shown up here. You have uh, six figures on the left and six figures on the right. There is some property that holds true of all the six figures on the left, which separates it from the six figures on the right. And if you spend some time thinking about this, you will see the answer to this geometric puzzle. Uh, so I was fascinated by this and decided this is what I wanted to spend my life studying. Uh, and I was fortunate to be able to come here to the United States uh, where I've remained ever since um, in studying this. And we'll see where we are in solving problems like this. So the three individuals in the book um, uh, was Kurt Gödel, who was a famous mathematician, a logician. And um, what he showed was mathematics uh, is incomplete in the sense that ever since the Greeks, it was believed that if you write down a set of axioms, um, for example, the axioms of geometry, you could prove any statement about geometry. What Kurt Gödel showed in a stunning uh, paper in the early part of the 20th century is that that is not true. Any system of axioms that is powerful enough to capture arithmetic will always have statements that uh, you can never prove to be either true or false. 
Uh, and this was a huge setback uh, to mathematicians and logicians who thought that um, mathematics was all powerful, that all you had to do was write down the right axioms and you could prove anything. Um, Escher was an artist who used mathematical ideas to draw pictures. In this case, uh, he's showing um, a group of monks who are uh, ascending what looks like an infinite staircase because they're going round and round and yet they come back to the same place. Um, and clearly this is impossible, but uh, he fools us with this visual illusion. And Johann Sebastian Bach was um, a famous classical composer whose work uh, forms the foundation of Western classical music. So what these three uh, gentlemen have in common is the ability to think abstractly, um, and their work has really transformed our world. And the question we have in AI is, can machines ever do anything like this? So I'm gonna begin my story with uh, Alan Turing. Uh, many of you may know Turing. Um, Turing was inspired by Gödel's work on the incompleteness theorem in logic and came from England, spent a few years at Princeton, um, and uh, went back to England uh, and played a decisive role in the Second World War. Turing's role in that uh, was, uh, remained secret for many years. He was the leader of a group in Bletchley Park, which was a super secret facility. Uh, which was tasked with breaking the Enigma code that the German uh, Nazi high command was using to communicate to uh, their uh, troops, in particular to the U-boats that patrolled the Atlantic. It was absolutely crucial for uh, the war effort that the Enigma code be broken. And uh, Turing uh, was amazing in the sense that not only was he a brilliant mathematician, but he was a gifted engineer who built the, one of the early computers to break the Enigma code. Turing is also considered one of the founders of artificial intelligence because in 1950, he wrote this paper published in a journal called Mind, and uh, the paper uh, starts with the statement, I propose to ask the question, can machines think? Instead of Taking a philosophical approach to this question, Turing took a very practical approach and said, let's imagine a test where uh, you can communicate with some entity. Um, these days we can think of using our smartphones to send text messages and you get back text messages. The question is, are you communicating with a human being or a computer? You can send images, you can send pieces of music and depending on the responses, you can decide if you are communicating with uh, a bot, uh, a computer, or a human. So Turing proposed this as a test, and this has become, since 1950, an article of faith in AI that our goal is to try to see if we can uh, mimic all the abilities that a human has. So one of the most influential uh, science fiction movies uh, in the 20th century was this one uh, by Stanley Kubrick. Um, it was called 2001 A Space Odyssey and it featured an AI computer named HAL. Um, if you've not seen the movie, I will not spoil the suspense for you, but the whole movie shows how HAL, which runs the uh, spacecraft that the astronauts are in, um, can converse with them in natural language, can play games, uh, can do many things that now we have started making machines do. In fact, there was a book recently that tracked the progress of AI using scenes from the book. So here, uh, from the movie, here's a famous scene where um, one of the astronauts is playing chess with Hal. So um, game playing machines have made remarkable progress over the last 50 years and um, the first game playing program that was successful was this one on the left by Arthur Samuel. In 1959, he programmed an IBM 701, uh, which is a clunky computer, uh, has less computing power than uh, the watch on my, my hand, and um, used vacuum tubes. He programmed it to play the game of checkers. When, when that was done, um, the head of IBM said that the stock of IBM would go up that day on Wall Street, which it did 
because people understood for the first time that computers could do things other than you know, complex calculations for uh, designing uh, atomic weapons or predicting the weather. Um, they could do things that, that humans uh, care about. Um, and since then, there's been a succession of breakthroughs. For example, the first uh, computer program that beat the world chess champion, and more recently, a computer program that beat the uh, best human player at Go. So it's safe to say that in games, we have made remarkable progress uh, in AI. So one way to understand AI, one way to build an AI system, is to actually look at what we're trying to reverse engineer, which is the brain. This is the one organ that gives us all the wonderful things that we do, from art and music uh, to technology and science. So how does the brain work? This has become the ultimate scientific puzzle. Our brains have 100 billion neurons, and there's a tremendous amount of work going on to try to uh, understand the brain. It's kind of like the ultimate enigma puzzle. So we can measure individual neurons in the brain, but it's very difficult to understand what is the brain actually doing. As you're listening to me speak, your brain is hard at work taking my voice and the images and con constructing a representation in your head. And uh, this is something that is, we take for granted, uh, but it's truly an amazing uh, amount of computation that's going on. So there's been various levels of progress at this, but I will point to one recent discovery by a group of biologists at the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech. Um, and what they've discovered is how we recognize faces. So faces are incredibly important for humans in social communication. And it has long was long suspected that we have dedicated circuitry in the brain for faces. And what these biologists discovered is a group of 200 neurons uh, deep inside our visual cortex that seem to encode for different features of faces. And it's a remarkably simple solution to the problem of face recognition. So through studies like this, we can gain insights into how our brain works. And much of the recent progress in AI has come about from doing a very simple model of the brain, and these are called neural networks. So um, the actual neural networks in our brains are enormously complicated. Uh, the one shown on the right is a simple representation of the cells in your brain and you have a lot of them, 100 billion or so. In computer models, we use a much simpler kind of neural representation that mimics some of the features of real neurons. And yet, it seems that we can use these artificial neural networks to do remarkable things. So, uh, many years ago, uh, after I had received my PhD, I joined IBM Research where I was uh, fortunate enough to work on the project of trying to get uh, robots to learn. This was back in the time when uh, machine learning was still very much in its infancy. Uh, neural networks were just being developed, um, and uh, I had uh, a really fun time trying to put the two together. And we published a book, um, probably the first book of its kind on robot learning. And one of the chapters uh, was a project at Carnegie Mellon on uh, getting a truck to drive itself. Now, this is an interesting problem because humans have tried to program trucks to drive um, using computer vision, um, path planning, 3D models, and it was a complete failure. I remember because when I used to walk to class, um, I used to walk just this truck and, and you, know, you could walk past it and it was barely moving. Then an enterprising grad student said, well, why don't we just make it learn to drive, and this was sort of revolutionary, but uh, he had human drivers sit in the truck and drive it around Pittsburgh. He collected the images and the steering commands uh, of human drivers, and he trained a neural network. And for his PhD thesis, he showed it uh, zipping along Pittsburgh highways at 70 miles an hour, uh, in fact, in pouring rain. So this was a remarkable step because it showed that we could uh, make machines that learn to do tasks that we are unable to program computers to do. And today we see 25 years later after my book was published, 
that we have cars from companies such as Tesla, uh, which give you this ability to have uh, self-driving cars. So another area where there's been uh, substantial progress is computer vision. Once again, it turned out to be extremely difficult to program computers to recognize objects. As you look around the room, uh, your brain decodes the images that are uh, falling on your eyes, and within a few hundred milliseconds, you can recognize what the object is. Um, many years ago, one of the founders of AI, Marvin Minsky, uh, told one of his graduate students to work on the problem of computer vision and figured that the graduate student would take the summer to solve the problem. Um, and it turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, we were misled because we do it so well, we thought it would be simple. It's taken more than 60 years and it's still not solved. But um, the current networks, and we call them deep learning networks, because unlike the ones I showed you earlier on the previous slide, these have many, many, many layers of neurons. Um, the bar graph on the right shows you the error at one of the large uh, ImageNet data tasks, which has millions of images and thousands of uh, categories of uh, objects like dogs and furniture and so on. And uh, as you make the nets um, be deeper and deeper, um, the error rate drops. For example, with about 150 layers, uh, you get down to about 6%, and even deeper networks get you uh, accuracy that's better than human accuracy on this task. So currently, we can build these deep neural networks with thousands of layers, and they can do phenomenal things. Because this poses a challenge because these are very complex uh, models, and one of the difficulties is understanding precisely what the networks have actually learned. We can use these networks in all kinds of decision making, for example, um, we can use it in medical decision making um, to look at uh, x-rays and try to understand you know, whether a patient has a disease. But we cannot construct an explanation from these networks yet. And so this is one of the most challenging problems uh, in deep learning. We've also made substantial progress in natural language. We now have devices. Um, I'm showing Alexa from Amazon and a device from Google. We can converse with these devices in natural language. Um, it's clear that you know, every device uh, that we use every day um, will have some natural language capability. Um, and this greatly simplifies the design of these devices, ultimately being able to communicate with devices using our voice is much easier than fumbling with buttons, particularly, for example, if you've uh, gone to as many hotel rooms as I have over the years, and always there's a different um, alarm clock with a different series of buttons. Uh, and it's so much easier to simply tell Alexa, set the alarm for 3 a.m. or whatever you have to get up. Uh, and so natural language interfaces will greatly simplify the design of many devices. So um, I want to say a little bit about um, where AI is going. And um, one of the hallmarks of our imagination is the ability to be creative. Um, and the question is, can computers be creative? So um, this is an interesting question. And um, there's a new book that's just come out um, called The Artist and the Machine. And uh, this book actually looks at some of the ongoing projects in AI-based creativity. And I want to go through a couple of them just to give you a sense of where things are going. So one um, advance in neural networks um, has been a model that lets us uh, create uh, content. Um, and it comes about. Um, in a surprising way, so um, what I've shown you so far is neural networks that we can teach with examples. So we, for example, you want to teach a car to drive itself. You collect examples of what the road looks like and what the steering wheel position should be, and you teach the network to copy that and to generalize from it. Or you want to teach a neural network how to recognize faces, you give it lots of examples of faces um, and things that are not faces. But in this case, the advance comes about by having two neural networks uh, teach each other. 
And uh, this is called a generative adversarial network, or a GAN. So on the left, I'm showing the faces of two people. These are remarkably realistic images. But these people do not exist. They are fakes. Um, but they look absolutely realistic. And uh, GANs are able to create face images like this. And then just four years ago, we couldn't do anything like this. So the power of this technology is amazing because we can do all kinds of things with this. Um, some good and some perhaps not so good. So the way GANs work is uh, you have a, a two neural networks. You can think of this as uh, a network that generates the faces. It's called a generator. You can think of it as a student. And you have the discriminator or the teacher. In the beginning, both don't know anything, actually. So this is what makes it even more remarkable. So the discriminator is given a set of real faces. And every time the generator produces an image, the discriminator says, no, that's not a face. Or it looks, maybe it's like a face. And they teach each other. So the generator gets better at detecting real faces from fake faces. And the, and the, uh, the generator gets better at generating fake faces. And the discriminator gets better at telling them apart. And eventually, the generator gets so good that the discriminator is basically guessing randomly. So this technology can be used for many other kinds of uh, generation. But how about art? Art is not just generating faces. It's um, when we look at a famous painting by Picasso, it's not just that Picasso was trying to draw a face. Um, he was trying to represent reality in a different way. So one of the most interesting extensions of generative adversarial networks is something called a creative adversarial network. And in this case, um, this network uh, was given examples of many different styles of art, impressionism, cubism, uh, paintings by Rembrandt, and so on. And it was asked to produce art, but not in one of the given styles. So it was forced to be creative. And on the left is shown some examples of the art it's produced. I'm not an art critic, so I don't know how good these paintings really are. But people are now beginning to sell paintings produced by computers. I think there was an auction where a painting like this sold for about $500,000. Um, the best human art uh, sells for $100 million. Um, so who knows if we'll get there. But uh, this is just a sense of where we are today. So um, we've also made a lot of progress in uh, abstract reasoning. And one of the most challenging problems is to reason about causes. So as humans, we are deeply interested in understanding why something happened. So if we get a disease, our first question is, well, why did we get this? Is it something we did? Uh, and so we're always looking to understand the causes. And something that deep learning doesn't do well yet is to understand what caused something to happen. And there's work now on causal reasoning, which will provide the basis for the next generation of AI advances combined with deep learning, so that we have systems that not only can observe the world, but they can experiment with the world, to do causal interventions, and then they can do imagination as well. So this progress in trying to understand not just um, uh, computers that can do these things, but to understand our own brains. So this is a project at Carnegie Mellon. And, and the person on the right is Tom Mitchell, my PhD advisor, uh, with a neuroscientist. And uh, they built a computer program that reads your mind, in effect. Um, you can look at images of people in uh, cat scans or pet scans, have them verbalize certain words, and then you can look at their brain's activation patterns. And then you can reverse engineer that process so that you can have them think about a word, and then you can use the machine learning program to say, well, what is the word that they were thinking about? And this is uh, scarily, remarkably effective in some cases. This is um, early technology, and uh, but they're all, you know, this hope that this thing will, will go further. So to illustrate that, um, Facebook just recently acquired a company called Control, CTRL. 
that's developed a wristband that essentially reads your mind. So let's say that um, I want to pick up uh, my remote control, and I, before I even do that, my brain has to issue a command to my hands to pick up the remote control. And these neural signals can be recorded by this wristband, and you can get a computer to execute commands. So you can get things to uh, work by just thinking about it. So in some future generation, um, I wouldn't have to give this talk at all. I would just stand here and think about every slide, and, and the information would just be transmitted to a device that's plugged into you, and then you would just understand what it is I'm trying to say, right? So we're not there yet. So finally, I wanted to talk about the risk of AI. So um, Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, uh, said this recently. He said, artificial intelligence is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. Whoever becomes a leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. So these are powerful words, words from the Russian leader. Uh, we have to take them seriously, uh, which means um, our adversaries are spending enormous amounts of money investing in AI because they see the potential of AI, and this is something that uh, we cannot afford to ignore. Um, there was a book published about uh, the huge amount of investment that China is making in AI, and uh, I like this particular quote. If data were the petroleum in artificial intelligence era, China would be Saudi Arabia. Um, so a lot of the advances in AI recently have come about from uh, the, our ability to mine extremely large data sets. I currently work for Adobe Corporation in the Bay Area, San, San Jose. And uh, those of you probably know Adobe only from things like Acrobat or maybe uh, Photoshop, but Adobe runs uh, probably the world's largest uh, software system for uh, analytics on the web. So if you have shopped at eBay or Best Buy or Walmart, if you've flown on United Airlines, gone to Disney, uh, gone through Heathrow Airport, um, visited apple.com, in, in short, if you've done almost anything on the web, Adobe software has been analyzing your shopping behavior. So for example, Adobe Audience Manager processes over 100 billion transactions a day, uh, terabytes of data. And systems like this are now routinely consuming vast quantities of data on the web. So just imagine the potential of these systems as they get more and more proficient in understanding what people are doing. So uh, there's enormous good, but there's also considerable risk involved here. So um, one of the issues that has come up is the use of AI in uh, warfare. Uh, there was a letter circulated uh, some time ago um, that said we should ban uh, intelligent autonomous weapons. Um, it was signed by a number of people. Um, the people on the left are AI researchers. Stuart Russell is a professor of AI at Berkeley. He was on my PhD committee, so I've known him for over 30 years. Uh, Niels Nielsen was somebody who was uh, uh, very supportive of my earlier career in AI. And, and Tom Mitchell is there, my PhD advisor, and so on. And then on the right, you have people like Stephen Hawking, a famous physicist, um, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, and other things. So um, I did not sign this letter, um, partly because um, I think it's futile to expect that AI will not enter into warfare. Um, every advance in technology has found its way into, into weaponry. Uh, and I don't think AI will be any different. So um, where can we expect to go from here? Um, so about 50 years ago, there was a famous book written called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. It was a remarkable um, prediction of many of the things that uh, have come true. And uh, not just the advances in technology, but also the social implications of these advances. Uh, were predicted in Alvin Toffler's book. So there's a follow-on book that's being planned uh, by some friends of mine. Uh, it's called Aftershock. It's going to be released next year. I have an essay in this on machines that imagine. So what this book tries to do is to predict 
uh, what the future might look like, you know, 50 years from now. It's a very difficult business, of course. Uh, but 200 uh, people from different areas of uh, arts and science and technology uh, have written articles in this, in this book predicting what the future will be. So if you're interested, you can, you can read that. So with that, let me end. Thank you. I think we have a couple minutes for some questions, if you will stand for some sure, questions. Sure. So I'd ask folks to uh, come to one of the microphones and uh, ask a question. Thank you. Special prize for the one who asked the first question. I see some people moving. Okay, we've got a question. We've got a question down here, and uh, we also have a question. I'll take that person at the mic right there so we can capture it. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Thank you, and good morning. I'm curious uh, with respect to your future view of AI capability. Jordy Rose of Kindred out of Vancouver, British Columbia, predicts that our perception or conception of it is inadequate to gauge the effect on society. And as a founder of D-Wave, I kind of put some stock in what he has to say. So I don't know if you have a view or are aware of some of his comments with regards to our inability to adequately predict, contain, or control it. I think uh, prediction of where AI is going is a, is a difficult uh, problem. Um, you mentioned D-Wave, so um, one thing I didn't talk about, for example, is uh, whether quantum computing will uh, influence AI. Uh, there's been a uh, recent uh, hubbub that Google has uh, developed a 53-qubit quantum computer. Uh, so quantum computers don't use bits, they use qubits. And uh, they are they're potentially incredibly powerful, uh, far more powerful than uh, Turing machines, which are the computers we build today. So this is one of the areas uh, that could profoundly impact AI. Um, so, but, but it's too early to tell um, where this is going. I think uh, it's safe to say that um, the future will look nothing like we, we imagine it to be, although you know, we try our best to predict where things will go. Please go ahead and please identify yourself and uh, when you ask your question. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, my, my name is Rob Morris, and my question is how does one assign responsibility for the decisions that come from these AI systems? That's an excellent question. Um, let's take that uh, concretely. So I mentioned uh, that uh, we're now having self-driving cars. So as m many of you know, there was an accident uh, with a self-driving car that was uh, being tested by Uber uh, in Arizona, and it killed a woman, a pedestrian. So um, who's responsible? Um, this is a difficult question. Um, clearly, the responsibility for this accident rests with uh, the software that uh, was designed. Um, there's also apparently some responsibility with uh, the, the human because she was walking in a, in a place that was not well lit and it, you know, so on. So it's usually accidents are a combination of many factors. Um, so we will increasingly see um, accidents like this, particularly in self-driving cars because these are being used uh, on a regular basis now. Um, for example, I drive a car which has some amount of self-driving, and uh, every time I push the button says, that says, okay, you can drive now, I always worry. Um, and, and my wife is, of course, telling me, don't do this, 
Um, but as an AI researcher, it's hard not to see what the technology actually does. Um, but I must say I'm shocked at some of the videos I have seen online where um, people sit in these cars and turn on self-driving and go to the rear seat and take a video. Um, this, is, this is dangerous behavior. Uh, these cars are not yet robust enough. Uh, although Elon Musk tells us that he'd like to design the next generation of Teslas with no steering wheel and no accelerators or brakes. We'll, we'll see whether that, happen, whether that happens. But um, yes, we're, we're going to definitely uh, face this problem that um, we have to uh, start thinking of these systems as uh, you know, potentially causing uh, death. In, the, in those cases, how do we assign credit or, or blame, and, and uh, you know, we're going to have to, so this goes back to what I was saying about understanding causal reasons, causal reasoning, which is, you know, why did something happen? So if an accident happens with a self-driving car, we have to understand why did this accident happen? So I mentioned the transition from the Wright brothers to the Boeing, and a lot of that involved many accidents over the 60 years. But every time we learn from those accidents and we try to build safer uh, planes. And recently we see Boeing uh, involved in another controversy involving its uh, 737 Maxes. So there's an effort underway to understand why these planes crashed. And I think the same thing will be true of self-driving cars. We will see accidents happening and that will pave the, gener the way for you know, better self-driving cars. But this technology, uh, is here to stay. It's not going to go away. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time. We have uh, time just for one more question. There's a midshipman at the mic here on the, uh, that side of the mezzanine. Go ahead. Midshipman Kaplowitz. Sir, when do you think we will have um, strong artificial intelligence to the point where it passes all the, you know, the requirements of the Turing test and it's like a human being? Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, what you're referring to is uh, essentially something that can pass the Turing test. Um, this is, again, hard to predict. Um, I'll give you an example of something I didn't talk about. Uh, so a lot of the early success in AI were in very controlled uh, environments like games. And a lot of us thought that um, we will get success in things like games, but in open-ended kinds of problems, it will be much more difficult. So a few years ago, Google, uh, excuse me, IBM demonstrated a program uh, that beat the best human contestants at Jeopardy, uh, the quiz show. And this was a remarkable uh, advance because unlike chess, um, Jeopardy involves questions on virtually any possible topic. You can get questions on art, science, technology, music, society. Uh, and if you watch the Jeopardy quiz show, the questions come from all over. And yet they had a computer program that could essentially answer all of these questions better than the best humans. So um, I think that demonstrated for the first time that it is possible to build computer programs that can assimilate vast quantities of knowledge uh, by essentially reading the web. So in that case, uh, IBM's Jeopardy essentially um, was given the entire Wikipedia encyclopedia. Now for a human, if you're even a fast reader, it might take you 20 to 30 years to read through Wikipedia. Um, today, we have computer programs that can read through Wikipedia in one afternoon. Uh, now, the difference is they don't perhaps understand all the articles in Wikipedia as deeply as, as humans do, but it's kind of frightening to think of what will happen if they do. And um, so people have been developing software that analyzes the scientific literature. There was a recent paper in Nature that showed that a computer program read through essentially millions and millions of scientific papers uh, in material science, and was able to accurately predict um, some advances before they had actually happened. So they, they did a 
study where they went back you know, a decade or two and they looked at all the papers and this computer program was able to predict um, certain advances before they actually happened. So, so we have tantalizing bits and pieces of the power of this approach. Uh, but I think we still don't have the capacity to put it all together in one system. Um, so, but we will see, you know, significant progress in AI in the next decade or two, and uh, it will become just a part of our everyday lives. Thank you very much to our speaker, Dr. Mahadevan. We really appreciate you setting the stage today. Thank you. Shruthar, we've got your, a book for you. It's a Naval Institute Press book called Cyberspace and Peace and War by Martin Labicki, who happens to be a, a prof here at the Naval Academy. It's a small token of our appreciation, and we thank you for your participation. This yeah. has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break and come back at 10.05. Thank you. <laughs>